Ephesians 1, 3, actually, as that loads up. I'm sorry I'm not ready. I thought I was ready, and I got to talking to people. No internet. Hopefully it hooks up to the internet, and there we go. Do, do, do. I'm going to read from Ephesians 1, uh, 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through, the, through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. <sighs> that is just this passage where Paul unloads, right at the beginning of the letter, just the, the riches, the inheritance, the glory, the beauty that we have in uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, but such a great statement of God's sovereignty in all things. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so in, th in this class, what we're going to be talking about is God's eternal decrees. And I gotta get the PowerPoint. So we're in chapter three, and it's of God's eternal decree. And what you have on, on that handout that I gave you is chapter 3 of the Westminster Confession of Faith that says page 1 on the top right, and it has the date. That's chapter 3, and so if you have one of these books or a white one of these books or a book like this, it's, this is all of chapter 3. There's eight points to it. And then what I give you on the back, it says page 2, and uh, at the top it says the decrees of God, and I took out from the shorter catechism and the larger catechism the sections that apply to this doctrine of the decrees of God. And so that's what we're going to be going through today. And as a reminder, because as we teach this, I'm not looking just to teach you the doctrines that we believe, although that's most important, but I'm looking to teach you how to understand the documents that we're getting them from because the Westminster Standards are our understanding of Christianity. So when, when I teach, or when an elder here teaches, or a pastor here teaches, this is where it's coming from. 
And so there's the Westminster Confession of Faith, as we discussed, and that has chapters that very systematically tells us the doctrines. And then the larger catechism and the shorter catechism explains these doctrines in question form. So almost like, well, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. And that's why we go through it uh, the way I, I am on, in this class. As I've said, Reformed theology really roots and grounds itself in two things, God and his word. So I say the triune God of the Bible and the Bible of the triune God. That's where we get, we don't get theology from our own minds. Okay, there's enough in creation to understand some things about God, but doctrines of God we, we get from his word. And that's why the Westminster Confession starts with, in chapter 1, Scripture, and Pablo taught all about the doctrines of Scripture in chapter 1. Last week, I covered the doctrine of God. And the reason we go in this order is, first, we have to establish what Scripture is, because Scripture is what tells us what we are to believe about God. This week, we're going to then talk of God's eternal decree and what that means. In this, something I highlighted last week was we have to hold these very deep doctrines um, in a sort of tension. It doesn't always make sense. And every time a heresy popped up in church history, it's because people wanted to swing to one side or the other. And so people say, well, are these contradictions? Well, no, in Christianity, we call these not contradictions, but paradoxes. Paradoxes are seeming contradictions, things that don't seem from our perspective to make sense, but if we had all the information, they would make sense. And what we know in so many of these doctrines is it can't be this and it can't be that, but it has to be both at the same time, yet these things seem to contradict. How do we hold that together? And so we're going to see that in today's doctrine of God's eternal decrees, because how is God sovereign over all things, and yet we still are responsible for our actions, and we still make our own choices, and yet somehow God is sovereign over that. Now, I don't know that we're going to resolve that here, and that's why I show this slide, but what I do know is I know I am fully responsible for and in control of my decisions. I know that, and I know God, who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, is knows all things because he has brought about all things. <laughs> if things happen outside of him, then he's not that God. And that makes things, uh, ideas, concepts, principles, characteristics on the same level as God. That's not a God that created all things because then that God would seem to have to have been created if things exist alongside of him. So in chapter 1, these are some of the doctrines of Scripture covered in that first chapter. So when we use these, some of these words, authority of Scripture, what the doctrine of revelation is, the doctrine of inspiration, inerrancy, perspicuity, which means clarity, and sufficiency, which means Scripture has everything we need for life and godliness— Chapter 1 of the Westminster Confession tells us these doctrines. And of course, what I love about the Westminster Standards is it's all, you know, they're called proof texts. I don't like the, the phrase proof text. They're scripture references that back up the doctrines is what they are. Then last week, we looked at the doctrine of God. And here were some of the doctrines that were fleshed out from chapter 2 in the Westminster Confession of Faith. The aseity of God, which means he's self-existent. Divine simplicity, which means God is a unified whole. He's not made up of parts. The immutability of God means he doesn't change. The impassibility of God means he's not driven or affected by, his, by what we call emotions. God is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, uh, omnibenevolent. I don't have the Bible verses for that. God, of course, is Trinity. Three persons instead of and one God in one God. Let me correct that right here in case that's on the video. And 
then that shorter catechism, what is God? God is spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, and his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. It's a good thing to, me- to memorize. kind of rolls off the tongue. So this week, we talk about then, what are God's eternal decrees? In other words, like, like why does all this exist? How does it all exist? Why is it here, and what's controlling it? And so we get to this idea of God's eternal decree. I read you Ephesians 1, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now what's interesting is that people who don't like a Calvinistic doctrine of predestination often take that first part, which says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose. They say, well, that's predestination for those who accept Christ, they get eternal life. That's what's being predestined here. People who have faith get eternal life. Well, that's not what that says only. What is, how does he predestine those things? According to the purpose of him who works what? All things according to the counsel of his will. And so this is the teaching of Scripture. Um, So I'm going to show us a quick video, and then we're going to dive into this. And I will say, this class is going to make some some of us... Actually, this class should make all of us uncomfortable. It's going to make some people a little bit more uncomfortable. And just bear with it, okay? Bear with it. Let's see what Scripture says. I'm not going to act like this is easy to understand, because we we can't really wrap our minds around it. But like I said, this is paradox. I know God is in control of all things, and I know that I am responsible for everything I do. And we're going to see what Calvin says about that, by the way. But first, let's watch this video clip. This video is funny because it must be 40 years old. Sproul is so young here. Maybe more. The third chapter of the Westminster Confession begins with these words. God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and immutably, that is, without possibility of changing it, freely and immutably ordain whatsoever comes to pass, semicolon. Let me take a breath there uh, at the point of the semicolon. God from all eternity, according to his own holy and wise counsel, did freely and immutably ordain or foreordain whatsoever comes to pass. And I paused at that point in the seminary classroom and I said to my students, how many of you believe that statement? I have to understand this was a Presbyterian seminary, so these fellows were pretty well steeped in the Augustinian tradition. And uh, I got like a 70% vote there that uh, that large number believed it. And I said, okay, how many of you don't believe that statement? And 30 or so hands went in the air. And I said, fine. Now let me ask another question. I said, without fear of recriminations, uh, nobody's going to jump all over you. We just would like to know. Feel free to state your position. How many of you would call yourselves atheists? And nobody put their hand up. And uh, I went into my Lieutenant Columbo routine. There's just one thing here I can't understand. (laughs) I said, and I I looked at those 30 who had raised their hand, and I said, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? I said, I can't figure out why those of you who raised your hand saying you did not believe this statement didn't raise your hand when I asked if you were atheists. And they looked at me with a mixture of puzzlement, but with the same kind of looks I'm seeing in your eyes here <laughs> today. And, and I was saying, because if you don't believe this statement, you understand that fundamentally, bottom line, you're an atheist. And that was a, about the most outrageous thing they ever heard in their lives. And I said, well, let's, let's uh, understand that this statement that I've just read, that God has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass, is not a statement that is unique to Calvinism or to Presbyterianism. 
It doesn't distinguish the Reformed tradition from other traditions. It doesn't even distinguish Christians from Jews or from Muslims. This statement here distinguishes theists from atheists. Now they were still puzzled as I continued this uh, harangue. And uh, I said, don't you see that if there's anything that happens in this world outside the foreordination of God, that if there's no sense in which God is ordaining whatsoever comes to pass, then at whatever point something happens outside the foreordination of God, it is therefore happening outside of the sovereignty of God. When he, when he did that, does anybody know? Like I said, 40 years ago, maybe maybe more. But what's, uh, what's interesting is if, if he gave that same lecture now, he'd have a lot more hands go up and wouldn't consider themselves to be atheists because what's, what's grown in our world and in our culture is this theology called open theism. And I really believe this is becoming one of the more dominant theologies in, in the Western civilization and in the world if, if somebody believes in God. It's this idea that to protect God from kind of ordaining things that we don't like from happening, they, they make God what's called open theism, that he doesn't know the future, that he's just responding and reacting in the present to direct things. And so I wonder what Sproul would say about that development, and no doubt he knew before he died about open theism, but um, I think that's the way a lot of the world thinks of God, is God is, is playing defense at every kind of moment in time, and because he, he, he's, he's got this infinite mind and ability to control all things in the moment, he's able to direct, you know, it's kind of like there's like a, a toddler going around and you kind of make sure they don't fall over, you know. But that's not the picture that the Bible presents of God. The picture the Bible presents of God is that every single thing he is in control of. And that might have been a hard thing to understand. Yikes, why are these all blue? But given supercomputers today that can do calculations like millions or billions of calculations in nanoseconds. I don't know. I got computer guys here. They can correct whatever it is. But like if we can make a machine that can control all kinds of things all at the same time and make every calculation, calculation and adjustment and adjust, like why would we think an infinite mind wouldn't be able to be far superior to that? But what Sproul just read is, is it's number one on your sheet on page one. For God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. What does the word ordain mean in this context? What would you say? What is, sorry, what would you say? Well, louder though. Set to happen. It's pretty good. Permit, okay. Approval. I think those are getting at it. Huh? I, 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 th I think the word is much stronger than, than that. It's he is determined, therefore, like per permission is, is, you know, it's like that Bible verse that we read in, in, in Genesis where Joseph has his brothers and he says, you meant it for evil. And then people always said, but God used it for good. That's not what it says. It says, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Not God used it for good. God meant it for good. You see, there's a difference. We, we've taken control out of the hands of God. And, and, and again, as if he's like just simply allowing things. cause to happen, brings them about, determines they will happen. 
So it's not that God saw Joseph's brothers doing this evil thing to sell Joseph into slavery, and he said, okay, I think I'll use that for good. God had purpose, intentionality to do that. The same meaning or intention the brothers had to do it for evil, God had to do it for good. Uh, we'll continue. Oh, wow, look at those Bible verses. You can't even read them. They're in blue. I guess because they're links. Yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty of contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. So that's that tension, right? On the one hand, God has foreordained everything that comes to pass, but somehow God isn't the author of sin. He's not violating our free will in that. And it doesn't remove the fact that God does things through second causes. So when the Bible says that God waters the earth, it doesn't mean that the authors didn't know that there were clouds that rain was dropping water. God uses the nature cycles to accomplish his will. Those are primary causes, God, secondary causes, whatever he created to do what it does in creation. And so God uses secondary causes. God isn't violating creatures' wills in his foreordination. Again, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Joseph's brothers weren't forced in any way, shape, or form to sell him into slavery. And yet that was necessary to happen for Joseph to be lifted up to the second most powerful person in the world to save basically the world from famine. Oh, I, there, there, there's the slide. Oh, so. Genesis 50. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So that's a, that's, that's a great Old Testament verse that holds in the tension of man's will and responsibility and God's sovereignty over it. There's, there's a great New Testament verse that does the same thing. Do you guys know what it is? No, that's a great, that's a great verse, though. That's Romans 8, which really corresponds to Ephesians 1. Yeah, that's good. Um, but I'm, I'm talking about a verse that shows man's, respons man's uh, responsibility for his actions, yet God's plans in that. What's that? Yeah, what, what verse is that? That's a, a Philippians, right? Huh? Yeah, yeah. What? Glenn, what were you going to say? What were you going to say, Glenn? Sure, God, God bring about his, act, his, his will through the plagues in Pharaoh. So in this case, this is that Old Testament verse. Here's the, the New Testament one that does the same thing. So Peter gives his great Pentecost speech. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. He sets that up to show, to show them their responsibility and the judgment. You saw what Jesus did. This Jesus delivered up. Why? According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Do you see that, that, that tension? The definite plans and foreknowledge of God, you did this. Who's held responsible for it? People. Why did it happen? God foreordained it. And you better believe that this wasn't God playing defense. This was the plan from the foundation of the world, or else another, none of us would be sitting in this room praising God. <laughs> you get it? So the, D Genesis, uh, let's see what that was. It was a 50. Genesis 50 and Acts 2 are just great verses. Whenever people want to say, well, what about free will? What about, how do you say God is sovereign? Say, I don't know, but the Bible says it, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, that man is fully responsible and God is fully sovereign. And I, and I ask you in your own life, you know that to be the case. <laughs> you know you are responsible for what you do and what you say, and you also know that God is working Romans 8 that was already mentioned, all things out in your life. And you're like, but I made that decision, but God made that decision. It's like, we don't know. 
And that's why Calvin's Institutes, sorry, I get, this thing's bothering me. You know, if, if Calvinism is known for one thing, it's predestination, right? And so everybody says, oh, you're not Calvinists, predestination. And so Calvin, this theologian of predestination, you notice Sproul, by the way, talked about being an Augustinian. That's Augustine. Augustine lived in the 4th century, the 300s, and Calvin is just building on Augustine. But in, in, the, in Calvin's third book in his Institutes, chapter 21, where he gets into this, the decrees of God and God's sovereignty and in election and everything else, he says this. It's really, it's really amazing to hear this from Calvin. Golly. Come on. Before I enter on the subject, <laughs> I have some remarks to address to two classes of men. The subject of predestination, which in itself is attended with considerable difficulty is rendered very perplexed and hence perilous by human curiosity, which cannot be restrained from water, wandering into forbidden paths and climbing to the clouds, determined if it can that none of the secret things of God shall remain unexplored. When we see many, some of them in other respects not bad men, everywhere rushing into this audacity and wickedness, he calls, he calls people that, that dig too deep into this mystery of how does it work out, man's will and responsibility and God's sovereignty, he calls it wickedness. <laughs> it is necessary to remind them of the course of duty in this matter. First then, when they inquire into predestination, let them remember that they are penetrating into the recesses of divine wisdom where he who rushes forward securely and confidently, instead of satisfying his curiosity, will enter an inextricable labyrinth. You, any of you guys know what he's talking about? <laughs> Do you ever get kind of lost pondering this? Trying to understand how is God foreordaining everything that comes to pass, yet we're all responsible for this? And when it gets very personal too, like loved ones that don't come to faith or suffering in people's lives and really just kind of, I mean, it, it could plow people into despair. For it is not right that man should with impunity pry into things which the Lord has been pleased to conceal within himself and scan that sublime eternal wisdom which it is his pleasure that we should not apprehend but adore. What does he mean by that? Say that louder. Right, and but then he says, "But adore." So why, why, how, how is it a doctrine to adore? Yeah, because without it, none of us would be sitting here <laughs> as Christians. It's unfathomable. lost my place that therein also his perfections may appear those secrets of his will which he has seen it to meet seen it meet to manifest are revealed in his word revealed in so far as he knew to be conducive to our interests and welfare so what calvin is saying is god gave us in his word what he wants us to know about this and to try to delve too deep philosophically into how that works like, what does it do? If you, draw, if, you, if you delve too far into it, you become deterministic and crazy because then you think, well, the God, or, God has, uh, is responsible for sin. God is violating people's wills and all that. And yet we know that can't be true. But we all, so then to go the other way, and it's like, well, then God doesn't know anything. And that be, then you become an open theist. And then, well, then you have no hope then that things aren't outside of God's control. But yet, it should be there such that for Christians, it brings joy and hope for us. Yeah, Jason. And 
that's that Roman 8 Colette mentioned, right? All things work together for good for who? For those who love God and are called according to his purpose, right? Yeah, very good. We trust and rest on God's goodness to get us through this. Now, what's interesting is um, the last... So I read, we've already read number one of chapter three. I'm going to jump down to number eight because I, I love that the Westminster Standards, the Westminster Confession goes the same place that Calvin goes with this. Um, Calvin wrote his, his, his institutes in the 1500s. The Westminster Standards were written, I think, 100 years later, give or take. So this is what the divines, the Westminster divines, that's what they're called, uh, says. The doctrine of this high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care that men attending to the will of God revealed in his word and yielding obedience thereunto may from the certainty of their effectual vocation be assured of their eternal election. So this doctrine, so shall this doctrine afford matter of praise, reverence, and admiration of God and of humility and diligence and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel when you grasp the sovereignty of God in your salvation and you really grasp it and you really grasp his holiness and what you're capable in your, of in your sinfulness this doctrine is our only hope. <laughs> and that's what it's saying. Uh, it says this to be handled with special prudence and care because it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, um, particularly when we have lost loved ones, like why isn't God saving them, right? I think we all know that pain and that concern. And then where I always go is, well, I know I didn't be deserved to, I, was, I didn't deserve salvation, I'm just gratefully plucked me out you know so uh, number two three and four although God knows whatsoever may or can come to pass upon all supposed conditions yet he has he not decreed anything because he foresaw it in the future or as that which would come to pass upon such conditions what is it saying there? I know I, I, I might have got some of the words wrong when I copied it in. But he has not decreed anything because he foresaw it in the future or as which would come to pass under such conditions. What is it trying to protect against or argue against or argue for? Yeah. Nothing makes the decisions for God. Yeah. What, what's an Arminian say about predestination? Right, right. So when Sproul said, if you don't believe in that first paragraph of the Westminster Standards, then you're not a theist. You don't believe in a conception of God. Because if, if things are outside of God's control, then you're not, you're not believing in a God. You're just believing in another thing. The same thing goes with predestination. Every Christian has to have a view of predestination. When, when a Christian is asked, do you believe in predestination? If they say no, they're outside the bounds of normal Christianity. Even Arminians, even those that don't believe in predestination the way a Calvinist does, believes in predestination because the Bible uses the word repeatedly. So what Arminians believe about predestination is God knows what you will choose because he looks at history he could see the timeline, and he says, okay, George will choose me, so I'm going to save him. Right. Right. It's a, it's a uh, sophisticated way to basically, at the end of the day, then God's not sovereign. He is still then subject to your choice. And this is what that's saying. He isn't decreeing something because he foresaw it. God isn't deciding things because he knows the future. God knows the future because he decided it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. If it's not that, then it's not grace. It's works. That's good. Um, and then when it says, or as that which would come to pass on, upon such conditions, it says that God isn't then, that's protect 
protecting against another view that says God creates scenarios so that people will choose what he wants them to choose. Once again, that's kind of... People are trying to protect God from the bad things that people are doing, and in doing so, they're robbing him of his sovereignty. So... Uh, number three, by the decree of God for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life and others foredained to everlasting death. It's very sad. But what we have to remember as we think of that is we deserve the death. These angels and men thus predestined and foreordained, God's ordaining something is his his declaration and decision that that is, is happening, his blessing upon the action of it, uh, are particularly and unchangeably designed. And their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be increased or diminished. That really goes without saying if you believe the other things. He's predestined it. Let's, uh, let's listen to another video. Um... We heard from Piper. Let's hear from Sproul. Sproul has just written a big book on providence. Uh, what is this? Uh, right here. Okay. Has God predetermined every tiny detail in the universe, such as dust particles in the air? And then I should add here, including all our besetting sins. Yes. Uh, there's a great quote from Spurgeon about dust motes. I don't even know what a dust moat is, but when I get up in the morning in my room, there's a, a window to the side of the bed here and a beam of light will be shining through at certain times of year when I get up. It's shining through, and as, as I look into the dark, I see nothing. As I look through the beam, I see the dust in the room. <laughs> I'm flying around saying, I'm breathing that stuff. Yes, you are. Um, so Spurgeon says, every one of those is keeping its position and moving through the air by God's appointment. Now, the reason I believe that is because the Bible says the dice are thrown in the lap and every decision is from the Lord. That's Proverbs, what, 16, I'm not sure. Six, chapter 16 has a bunch of these verses in it from Proverbs. And um, why would he choose the die or the lot? is cast in the lap in every decision because he's trying to think of the most random thing he can think of and and he says that so randomness is not random to god god is not the least taxed by keeping every um sub nuclear particle in its place i used to say electrons but now there's something smaller than electrons <laughs> Uh, every everything in the in the middle of the molecule moving and the electrons he's got them all in orbit just like he has the planets in orbit so the macro the macro world and the micro world are all managed by god which means yes every horrible thing and every sinful thing is ultimately governed by god and that's a problem but the center of the solution to the problem is a choice you have to make about the cross. This is what has centered me anyway. When you go to Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28, and you read that Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the Jews were all gathered together to do what your hand and your plan had predestined to take place, in the killing of Jesus, you have God's plan and hand predestining the most horrible sins ever committed. Pilate's choices, the soldiers' cruel mockery, the 
uh, piercing of his side, the cries, crucify him, crucify him. This, these few hours in history was the climax of the worst wickedness that has ever been performed on the planet or ever will be. And God planned it that we might be saved from those sins. In other words, what the devil did in unleashing all that was commit suicide. And I pray that when you contemplate believing in a sovereign God who governs the dust motes, the waves, including tsunamis, when you contemplate believing in a totally sovereign God, you will center it right on the cross. Because you'll go crazy otherwise. You will. These things have driven people mad. But it, it won't drive you mad if you say, he loves me. And he governed the most wicked thing that ever happened in the world, the crucifixion of my Savior and my God. If you stay right there and then just work out from there as far as your mind can handle, then you'll be safe. Your mind will be safe, your heart will be safe because you keep humble. People get very arrogant with these kinds of doctrines. They can use them to club people. But if you stay with the cross, uh, you won't. I mean, just one more thing on this. Um, this is right off my front burner because we're reading, you and I and a lot of other people in Bethlehem are reading through Acts. Because we're reading through the Bible and we start in Genesis, we go to Psalms, we read Acts and, and Matthew. We just read in chapter 2 where Peter said in the sermon to the people who had killed Jesus, you acted in ignorance. He didn't forgive them for that. He said they have to repent. You acted in ignorance, but God fulfilled what he had promised by the prophets that the Christ must suffer. That's like 222 or somewhere in there. Um, what that said to me was, again, okay, these people didn't know what they were doing. God knew what he was doing. So the crucifixion of his son was, according to Isaiah 53, 10, the bruising by the Father of the Son, and therefore the worst sin that was ever committed was ordained by God, and the answer is yes. He controls everything, and he does it for his glory and our good. What is, uh, <clears throat> how did Piper try to help us make sense of it the, the difficult thought that God is sovereign over everything and what does that mean about evil and Yeah, so Kerry said he took it to the cross, which is the most evil, horrific event known to mankind. <laughs> and no Christian really has a problem accepting that God brought about salvation through the cross. Well, how did he do that? <laughs> it wasn't because men decided that's how they were going to be saved. We're going to kill Jesus so we could be saved. That was God's plan from the foundation of the world. And so if God... And, and we just don't get it. I mean, like, Christ was sinless and perfect. We're upset if somebody cuts us off on the highway, like like justice has been violated. <laughs> but we're sinful, and he wasn't. And yet we don't have a problem with that, with God foreordaining that. So, and I think when we centered on the cross, like what Piper did, it really helps us to once again like remember he is creator I am creature his ways are above my ways like what I read in Job last week you know all those verses it's like and that's why Calvin says we can't go down the labyrinth you know and this is Calvin the guy who's you know like we're all like predestination John Calvin you know and he's like don't go too far down the labyrinth take what scripture says and live in the tension and find hope in the doctrine if you're in Christ because you don't deserve it. <laughs> but he loves us. 
Um, Romans 9, which is interesting, which really, really kind of explains this, and it's always interesting to see people explain away Romans 9. Try to say, no, that's they, they so hyper-contextualize -contextual, it that it doesn't mean anything anymore. I always say, like, when you have the same question that the Bible asks and answers, like, go with what the Bible says about it, <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, 9.14, Paul's been talking about the choosing of Jacob over Esau, Esau, and God's choosing of people. And it's funny, I just read that today in the scripture reading plan about Jacob and Esau, and I felt bad for Esau. Like, Jacob steals the blessing right from out from under him, you know. But God chose Jacob. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? And that's exactly what people ask today when, when they don't want to say, well, how, what do you mean God chooses? That would make God evil. That would make God this. That would make God what, unjust? Is, he's asking the question. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Is God wrong to do this? Are we going to tell him he shouldn't be doing this? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. That is the answer. How do you want to explain that away? God has mercy on who he wants to have mercy, and compassion on who he wants to have compassion. And who he doesn't, he doesn't. Right, they do say that, which makes no sense because it's based on the, the next verse, right? So, for, uh, for, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but God who has mercy. So that's not partiality because partiality would see something in a person and choose that person based on some intrinsic quality they have. And that's what Arminians do because if somebody, uh, they say, well, they have to choose Christ. But what gives that person the ability to choose Christ and somebody else not to? You know, something has to be wrong with you. If I say, here's a million dollars, it's free. Do you want it? And somebody says, no, I don't want it. <laughs> so I love this. Not on, uh, so it depends, so then, it depends not on human will or exertion. So what's the exertion mean? What'd you say? Yeah, keeping the law, effort, works, doing. It's not based on anything you do. It's not based on any of your exertion. Exertion is action, right? If I'm exerting myself, I'm doing. It's not based on anything you do, but it goes beyond. It's not based on your will either. It's not, so then it depends not on human will or exertion. It doesn't depend on what you want, and it doesn't depend on what you do. But on God who has mercy. could read the rest of nine for yourself i mean it really kind of lays it out has the potter no right over the clay verse 22 i think kind of gives us some insight into this and it's it's again it's tough but what if god desiring to show his wrath to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory even us whom he has called. What is he saying there about the vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy? Yeah. So, would you know what you were saved from if there was no judgment? <laughs> Would you appreciate what you have if you didn't know what you could lose? <laughs> it's tough, I'm telling you, I know. Yeah. Not for God, none of us would choose him. We'd all get hell. Uh, number, number six says, And God has appointed 
the elect unto glory, so has he by the eternal most free purpose of his will foreordained all the means thereunto. So foreordained all the means thereunto. So how you come to faith in him is foreordained. You know, people say, well, you Calvinists, you must not care about evangelism. Some of the greatest evangelists were Calvinists. They say, well, why would you? Why would you pray? Why would you evangelize? Because God who foreordained all things that come to pass has foreordained the means by which they're coming to pass. God has told us to evangelize and to make disciples. We obey him. <laughs> and we're like, wow, you're going to use me as an agent to bring your salvation to this person? Yes, use, what else do you want to be used for? Does prayer change God's mind? Well, in the words of R.C. Sproul, how can you change God's mind? <laughs> so why pray? You're talking to your Father. You're giving Him your heart. Through that, He is, it, it, it's grace that's being offered to you, and He uses your prayers to bring about things that He's going to do. How does that work? It's the tension. Yes, pray. Pray for healing. He will use your prayers in that regard. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he, we're learning through it. We learn about God. We're in relationship with God. We see his work. It's our sanctification to trust him. Uh, are effectually called unto faith in Christ by his spirit, working in due season, and justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith unto salvation. The yellow there is, is, is why the confession uh, says this is, is a hopeful thing to us, and Calvin says. It's, it's because, again, it's Romans 8. All those he uh, foreknew, he predestined to be conformed in the image of Christ, was it? what's the golden change of redemption? Although he, he knew, he called, he, or he chose, he called, he justified, he glorified. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I got a lot of things jumbled up in there. And these people say, why doesn't he mention sanctification in that Romans 8 uh, chain of redemption? Well, he's saying we are being conformed to the image of Christ. That is sanctification. It's, uh, so Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And what you see here is the same group is moving through this. All those he this become that. All those who became that become this. All those who he glorifies. There's no, nobody's getting lost out of the buckets. And that's why in John 6 is the same thing. Like Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and I won't lose any, and I will raise them up on the last day. Who comes to Jesus? All that the Father gives to him. And we explain these verses and try to explain them away. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but the elect only. So there's always the twofold response. And this is why the scripture can say that the word of God never returns void, that it accomplishes what it sets out to accomplish. How can we say that if we don't believe in the sovereignty of God? Because you guys, we preach the word, we tell people the word, and it seems to fall on deaf ears, and people don't get saved. Does that mean the word of God failed? No, sadly, it brought. Ju it, it will always do one of two things: salvation or judgment, grace or judgment. Every time, it will always accomplish what it is. It will always accomplish. It doesn't fail because Christ doesn't fail. Christ's redemption, His work on the cross, isn't. Um, doesn't create like the potential for salvation it actually saves a specific people oh there there it is uh and those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he 
called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's why all things can work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's right before this. And we're, we're basically done. Uh, that's saying very similar. Number seven, number eight. We did Romans eight. Okay. Any questions or thoughts or comments or It's hard, right? It's okay. It is. Yeah, let me let me let me just pull up some verses if you guys got time. If you got to go to your kids, I understand. Sovereign T, I spell it right. Piper had this this great um, video here talking about God's sovereignty, and he just does this litany of verses. Job forty two two. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Daniel 4.35, he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand. Uh, Isaiah 46.9, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. We already done Ephesians 1. Um, God's sovereign over nature. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deep. It makes the clouds rise at the end of the, he, he's in charge of everything. Jesus says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the Father. Uh, Second Chronicles, you rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Psalm 33, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. Proverbs 16, the, pl the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. I mean, there's just, there's just hundreds and hundreds of verses <laughs> that speak of God's sovereignty over every little aspect. I mean, like, if there's probably more verses teaching this doctrine than anything else in the Bible. I, I, don't, I haven't done that analysis. But where God is communicating, he's in control and in charge and bringing about all things, and he says, from the foundation of the world, not playing defense in real time. And so um, this is our God, and if you're, you belong to him, I know we care about the evil in the world, and our hope is, is a real hope that Christ will do away with all evil. And I know we have unsaved loved ones and while that's really hard to think that people we love are going to go to hell it's also very encouraging that it's not up to you or me and then we can witness to them freely and openly that should free us from thinking I don't know what to say because it's not you who's saying it anyway it's the Holy Spirit and so you don't have to worry about failing in that regard because God is in control of it and if, if that person belongs to him he will bring them to salvation. He might use you to do it. So, let's pray.